So I come from a family of five kids, and every member of every family, you know, you have your respective roles. But in my family, this is the breakdown. My older sister, Tina, is the pretty one. I'm the funny one. Julia's the sarcastic one. Britton's the boy. And Jill's the baby. And, you know, we're all capable of being many things, but in general, these are the roles that we play. And uh, my parents were young when they had kids, 20 and 21. And when you grow up with young parents, you're not so much kids as you are an experiment. <laughs> You've been there. Uh, some, uh, so I remember growing up, my dad came home from work one day and he said, do you guys know what serial killers are? And we were like, no. And he said, you guys are serial killers. And he piled us in the van, and we drove to the grocery store, and we got to pick out whatever cereal we wanted. <laughs> and squirt guns and masks. And we proceeded to drive to all my parents' friends' houses and ring the bell. And when they opened it, we would hold up our cereal and our squirt guns and say, put your hands up, we're cereal killers. <laughs> and then we would go inside and force them to eat cereal. <laughs> and that was just normal with my family. Um, but then something happened when my older sister was 11. Our lives completely changed. Uh, my dad got a job that moved us from this small town in Washington State to Spain. And my parents had never left the United States, and they were thrilled. They wanted to see as much as the world as they could possibly, uh, and it didn't matter that they had five small children who could care less. Uh, one summer, we went to 25 countries, and at the time, one of the kid catchphrases was, not another castle. <laughs> and at the, the thing I loved about my parents is they were really committed to each of us figuring out how to be our own person. And one summer, we took the ferry down to Morocco, and they took us to a carpet factory where all these children were working, and they paid the foreman to have us work for a day. So they dropped us off at a factory, and I worked an assembly line. And at the time, I didn't get it. I just thought, like, this is a really bad day. <laughs> but what I realized was that I couldn't take my life for granted because other kids didn't get to have my life. And yet, in the midst of all of this, we all still stuck to our respective roles. My role being, I was the funny one. And the reason I was the funny one was because I was chubby. And so I needed, you know, to use my sense of humor to get attention. And I think that role really was cemented on that trip to Morocco. We were walking down the street, and this man uh, stopped my parents because he'd noticed my older sister. And he said to my parents, your daughter is so beautiful. I will give you 1,000 camels for her. And my parents were like, no, thank you. And then he looked at me and looked me up and down and said, I'll give you 100 camels for that one. And I was like, 900 camels? There's a 900 camel difference between me and my sister? And honestly, the rest of my life can be described as a pursuit to be worth more camels. But you know, as I got older, I was still chubby. Um, at my heaviest, I was 265 pounds. So not chubby, clinically obese, but <laughs> semantics. And then in my mid-20s, I went on a diet, and I lost all of that weight. And I was living in New York City at the time, and my family didn't see me over the course of this entire diet. And it was a huge transformation. I went from a size 20 to a size 6. And you know, one thing I noticed immediately was how differently people treated me. You know, I went from being treated one way to a completely different way. And as exciting as it was to get attention or to be treated well, it was also kind of a jading experience because I knew I hadn't been treated that way before. And so in the midst of this kind of identity crisis, I got a call from my parents that we were going to go on a family trip to Cyprus. And I thought, yes. This is exactly what I need. I need to see my family, and I need to reconnect with who I really am. And as I flew on that airplane, I was suddenly struck by this wave of anxiety, because I thought, what, what if my family is like the rest of the world? What if they treat me differently now that I look differently? 
And I stepped off that airplane, and all six of them were waiting, and their jaws dropped. Like, I thought that was just an expression, but their mouths were wide open. They didn't even recognize me. And for the next hour, I mean, they were my family, but my family at a distance. And I watched them watch me, you know, and think, like, okay, that's Elna. And when Elna does this, that's how Elna looks when she does it, as if they were recalibrating their mind to recognize me. And then we got in the car, and maybe an hour later, I was drinking my water, and my dad made fun of me for drinking like a fish. And I was like, that's just how I drink. And then I spilled water all over myself. And they all started laughing, and just like that, the spell was broken. And I was back to being treated the way I had always been treated, which is what I thought I wanted. It wasn't. I wanted to be the pretty one now. <laughs> and this became very clear on the first night of our trip. We went to a restaurant, and we were having dinner. And in the middle of dinner, the restaurant owner came up to our table, and he looked at my sister, and he said, wow, you are so beautiful. And for a second, I thought he was pointing at me. And then I realized it was my sister, and I was like, oh. And then he walked back to the back of the restaurant and returned with a gold necklace, which he presented to my sister. And it was hideous, right? I mean, it was ugly, I don't, but I was filled with jealousy. I just kept thinking, that necklace should be mine. I'm like at least 750 camels, 900 with makeup. I mean, I deserve that <laughs> necklace. And we walked out of the restaurant, and as we were walking away, sarcastic sister turned to me and said, well, I guess Tina will always be the pretty one. And I, in a voice that so much resembled Frankenstein's, turned and said, no, I am pretty now. <laughs> and that was just the beginning. The second day of the trip, we were driving, and my dad was talking about elephants, and I, you know, I piped in with a joke. I was like, elephants are ella funny. <laughs> not, not funny, right? <laughs> Not really, not the best joke I've ever told, not funny at all. But sarcastic sister turned to me and said, Elna, you're not funny. And I started sobbing. Because <laughs> I was like, she's right. I'm not funny. But I'm not pretty. So if I'm not the funny one or the pretty one, then who am I? And I just started bawling loudly crying and crying, and my dad in the front seat turned around and was like, Elna, it's okay, you're funny, you are hysterical. <laughs> and then it was the third day of the trip, and meanwhile, you know, I had been on this diet the, you know, entire nine months, and on my diet, every day, I ate lunch at one o'clock. So, at one o'clock, I announced to my family, it's one, I need to eat at one. But we were driving to this other town, and we had to get there. And by the time we got there, it was two. And I said, it's two. I need to eat at one. So we started looking for restaurants, and everything was closed. There was no food anywhere. And I, in a hangry meltdown, sat down in the middle of the street and said, I needed to eat at one. No one listens to me. I'm not moving until you listen. <laughs> and my family left. And I waited for about 30 minutes. <laughs> and eventually, my brother returned and told me that they had found a Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I was like, oh, great, because that's on my diet, Kentucky Fried Chicken. But I followed him, and you know, in the Kentucky Fried Chicken, sitting in a circle, was my family, and an empty seat with a plate of fried food. And so I sat in the seat, and I you know, took napkins and sort of dramatically patted the food down. <laughs> and then took a fork and moved it around, trying to find something I could eat. And from across the table, my dad looked at me and said, good job, which, to his credit, apparently he meant good job, you know, trying to stick to your diet even though you're starving. But what I heard was, good job, you throw a fit, we stop everything. And so I took the plate of fried food and I shoved it across the table at him and I said, no one listens to me. I, it, I've changed. I'm a grown-up now. And when I say I eat at one, I eat at one. <laughs> and lunch was ruined. 
And we got back in the car, and my father was furious, and everyone was tense. We weren't talking. We just wanted to go home, but we still had to go to this place called Aphrodite's Rock. But my mother was navigating, and if she has a role in the family, it's uh, bad at navigating. <laughs> so she navigated for two hours to this other destination called Adonis's Bath. And we didn't realize it until we were almost there. And my parents started getting in this fight, you know, should we go, shouldn't we go? And they're in the front arguing about this. And, you know, we're driving along the side of this steep cliff. And from the front, I guess, my dad could see a very, very steep drop to a dirt road and a sign that said Adonis's bath. But in the back, we couldn't see any of this. So they're arguing, and he just says, okay, fine, have it your way, and steers towards the cliff. And all five of us in the back genuinely think, dad has had enough, he's driving us off a cliff. So we scream at the top of our lungs, no! And then, you know, we clear the cliff and we see the steep road and we're all laughing and, and screaming and we just keep screaming for fun and we're like, we thought you were gonna kill us! <laughs> And my parents start screaming too, and they're like, they thought we were gonna kill them. And we're whipping around corners like it's a roller coaster, screaming the entire way. And we get to this place called Adonis's Bath, and it was beautiful. It's these pools of water with waterfalls that go down into more pools with floating flowers and rope swings. And we spent the, day, the rest of the day there as a family, just playing in the water. And, you know, I stopped trying to figure out who I was or who I was supposed to be or how people saw me because I was with my family, you know, these people I'd been with my whole life, and I could be whoever I wanted to be. And at the end of the night, as we were leaving, my dad said to the man who ran the place, he said, you should really put this in a tourist book. It's the best thing we've done in Cyprus. And the man said to my father, you can't put paradise in a tourist book. You have to discover it. And to end this story, uh, in our basement, we have a couch called the Sharpie couch. It's a white leather couch that you write on in Sharpie when you feel like writing, because <laughs> why not? And the most famous thing on the Sharpie couch, my brother wrote when he got back from the trip, we walked through the door, he dropped his bags, picked up a Sharpie, and in giant letters wrote, top three things never to say to Elna. One, Tina's the pretty sister. <laughs> Two, you're not funny. And three, good job. <laughs> Thank you. Miss Elna Baker, ladies and gentlemen, what a story.